Other things I want to say about this, this methodology because it's extraordinarily powerful. The first thing is we can look at different formulations of different drugs and we've done that for different formulations of opiates and painkillers and what I particularly want to show you is the, diff the, the harm, relative harms of different formulations of nicotine because I know this is a topic of great uh, dis you know, controversy in Australia. So we did the same thing, and these were the results. On the left-hand side, the green is harm to the user, red is harm to society. And you can see that cigarettes, the tallest bar on the left-hand side, they're the only nicotine product that has any real harm to other people. And of course you say, well, we knew that because uh, of passive smoking. But what I didn't know at the time of doing this, and what I learned as part of being part of a process where we had you know, 15 real tobacco experts, is that half of all the fires in the world are caused by cigarette stubs. Two and a half thousand people a year are burned to death, either in their beds or because someone's thrown a cigarette stub out and they've been uh, caught in a forest fire. And that's why cigarettes are peculiarly harmful to other people. They're also very harmful to the user. And it was that particular study that then gave us the statistic or the, the estimate that electronic cigarettes vaping or what we call here ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery systems, were actually somewhere between about 20 and 50 fold less harmful than tobacco. And since then quite a few other uh, analytical papers have come to a very similar conclusion. And that's why I firmly believe that we should be encouraging everyone who smokes to switch to vaping. And that's why the Welsh Government have made vaping a medicine. They give people with chronic bronchitis who smoke, they pay for them to vape for free to reduce the number of days they spend in hospital. And then the f final thing was to go one step further and to try to work out whether using this approach you can actually develop better policies. And the impetus for this was a request by Norwegian experts. We got funding from the Norwegian Government Research Council to see if we could develop or work out a way of estimating the value of different kinds of policy options. Why was Norway interested in this? Norway is the richest country in the world, even richer than Australia per capita. Yet it has heroin death rates more than Scotland because it doesn't have a policy which protects people. And the Norwegian parliament wanted, or mem members of the Norwegian parliament are trying to have a rational debate about policy. And they thought, well, rather than just talk about policy, why don't we see if we can do something sensible and, and work out what the best policy might be? So they funded us, we did the decision conference where we spent two days trying to work out what the policy variables are. It turns out there's 27 variables which you have to consider when you're looking at policy change. That's even you know, more than the 16 you have to do for harms. And uh, that meant we couldn't do it for very many drugs. What we decided to do in the end was essentially to stratify the multiple different forms of policies that you could have into four. And you can see them here. They range from absolute prohibition through decriminalization, through controlled, state-controlled market to absolute free market. So f four r easily distinguishable policy options. And you can see there the, um, the how they affect different elements of drug availability from production, supply, taxation, etc. So you take all those variables and then you apply them to these 27 separate aspects. You can see it's really challenging. I mean, there's a huge amount of, of thinking that has to be done in order to do that. 
But we were able to do it. We were able to do it for uh, three drugs. Each one takes about half a day. And I'm going to show you the published data because the third one we haven't quite had appropriately refereed. But these two drugs have now been published in the uh, peer-reviewed literature. And these are cannabis and alcohol. And if you look at both of them, you'll see that the preferred option, so this is really is a value tree. This is up is better because we're looking at the value of different policies, those four different policies, prohibition, state control, decriminalization, and uh, free market. Uh, and you can see that for both alcohol and for cannabis, the best outcome, the, top, the tallest histogram is for state control. And you can see that uh, the others differ somewhat in whether decriminalization or prohibition is uh, better than the others. But you can see for both those drugs, a controlled market, state controlled market is, uh, we believe, the most logical market. Uh, we have evidence to support that if you, uh, from countries like Sweden, which has, a con has had a state controlled alcohol market for 50 years. And interestingly, uh, Uruguay has become the first country to have a state-controlled cannabis market. So uh, we're going to monitor the outcomes of that in, in, uh, in Uruguay to see whether uh, there are better outcomes than in other countries which have gone much more to the free market and see whether uh, our analysis is right. And I don't know whether the Norwegians are going to change their policies, but uh, at least if they don't, the people who object to what they decide will have something to argue with them about. And I just want to finish with this one clinical case, why we need a regulated market. So this man, Robert, he's a 16-year-old, I think. He lives in Kent, uh, and he goes up one day to score some cannabis. And his dealer says, hey, I've got some good E. Do you want some of that, Robert? He says, yeah, I'll take some E as well. Most dealers in Britain are a one-stop shop. They, cannabis, ecstasy, crack, heroin, you name it. So he takes the E with the cannabis, and he goes home and he drops the E. And he drops dead, because it's fentanyl, not ecstasy. And we've already heard how fentanyl is being added to opiates to try to mimic the effects of oxycodone and even heroin. But it's such a powerful drug, it's being added to anything that people are buying in order to at least give people an effect. But uh, the effect that poor old Robert got was not one he wanted. And I kind of feel that the only way to stop that, you're not even testing isn't going to stop this, a regulated market for drugs which are less harmful than alcohol, like ecstasy, is the way forward. And uh, if Australia wants to take the lead in that, I'd be delighted to help them. I'm going to finish. Uh, hopefully some of you know I write a bit more about this. Uh, there's my book, Drugs Without the Hot Air, which funds my charity. And there's a new book on addiction I've just, we just published last month, which some of you might find useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.